weakness exists. So let's get some perspective from our next guest. We have Charles Ortel, Managing Director, Newport Value Partners. He's among those who was recognized as having described the credit market collapse. Also, we have Dennis Hines. He's the Chief Market Strategist at R.W. Pressbridge and a former director at Morgan Stanley. Let's begin with you, Charles. You've written that it seems to be a tea party brewing in corporate America amongst investors and shareholders. What do you mean by that? Well, I think it's uh, very refreshing to see uh, the brave uh, and very smart David Einhorn stand up and uh, call for some uh, corporate justice at, at Microsoft, a stock that has really gone nowhere since uh, 1999 when it had really every advantage in the world. I think it's time to rise up and, and, and look very hard at, uh, across the spectrum of the big cap American domicile companies, companies I've called for some time now for some justice to be done at GE where uh, investors have basically been punished since uh, September 7th, 2001, and executives have been richly rewarded. Um, I think there's going to develop now a surprising unity of interest between actual uh, activist investors and unions, because in order to get these pensions to have any value, equities need to grow in value, and they certainly aren't under the stewards, stewardship of some of these entrenched, entrenched managers. But, Charles, isn't this an issue for the board of directors? I mean, after all, directors are supposed to look out after the shares, the, the interests of the shareholders. And you don't necessarily have to own shares in any of these companies, so why worry about it? If you don't like the management, go and buy something else. And if you do like the management, influence it by trying to influence the directors. I think the deck is at present stacked against activists. And um, basically, most directors are ill equipped to do the job that you really have to do to ferret out problems at companies and then push management teams, particularly at complex companies like GE. Uh, to really deliver for their shareholders. Even, uh, even, for example, if you're a large shareholder, if you're a large mutual fund company or a large institutional investor, you don't think that you have any pull that you can give them a call on the telephone or, or get together with a meeting and say, look, we own 4% of the company. Come meet with us. We've got concerns. Let me answer your question with a question. How many companies have seen their uh, inside directors replaced by such action in this new millennium? I think less than a handful, if that. And it's just, you know. So is this a corporate governance issue as much as it is a value issue related to the valuation of the stock? I think it's a corporate governance issue. I think it's an information arbitrage issue. I think it's a time issue. I think it's a compensation issue. I think the practice of allowing de directors to have uh, insurance. Um, personal liability insurance, in other words, that the directors themselves are personally indemnified. So they're not like, really at risk. I mean, I think, I think we're going to go through a period here now. We've had an unusual period since 1981 where interest rates have gone steadily down with some interruptions. They're on the floor. They could go maybe 100 basis points lower as they did in the last crisis on the tenure. But in that environment, dividend-paying stocks have been held up by that uh, the alternative is not being so good. So uh, in this long environment, and especially since 1999, some of these marquee names have, have woefully underperformed. And I see that changing. I see nominal interest rates going up. I see a lot of disappointment. And I see more voices joining those of, of Mr. Einhorn uh, who can actually make a difference. I think right, well, let's a good talk thing. about David Einhorn and, and Greenlight Capital. I mean, the, the, word, the report is that he described the management of Microsoft as a Charlie Brown management, right? Chief executive Steve Ballmer was in place, one could argue, at the behest not only of the directors, but of the founder of Microsoft, Bill Gates. If Bill Gates doesn't want Steve Ballmer in that role, do you think that he could get rid of him? I would hope he would. I mean, I, I, I mean, isn't that what happened at Howard, with, with Starbucks and Howard Schultz? He came back to the company, decided to take it over, and has marked a new path for the firm. It can happen. It can happen from time to time. But I think the lesson, in, one lesson in America here is that since uh, 2007, since August of 2007, um, we've had uh, rough justice administered to workers on Main Street, where in corporate boardrooms, pe woeful underperformers, people who have even flouted the rules, haven't, have gotten off scot-free. And I think the mood in this country is changing. I think you'll see it uh, tension heighten through the election season. And I think all of that's a good thing. Why, why, why does the election matter in terms of what happens in the corporate boardroom? What's the relationship? Well, uh, it used to be that if, if things were fine, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. 
Um, uh, I think that you know there's a sense, sentiment in America and in a lot of these countries that it is broken and it's time to fix it. So um, I think you're, you're seeing activism in the political front, you're seeing in the corporate front. I think you're going to see uh, there's in, in, intense polarization in this country. It's all going to be brought to a boil, I think, in 2012. Is it is it possible though that these corporations have just gotten too big, too complicated, and difficult to run? That one person really is not going to make all that much of a difference. I think in some cases it certainly is possible. Some of these companies are too flawed to rescue, and they need to go through the natural cleansing process. By keeping these values high, uh, I think we're doing them a disservice. Uh, and I think when history is written, say, 10, 20 years from now, on the rescues of the automotive giants, for example, we may well find that we made a big mistake propping these companies up. All right. My guests are Charles Ortel, Managing Director, Newport Value Partners, and I want to bring in Dennis Hines now. He is the Chief Market Strategist at RW Pressbridge. Dennis, good to have you with us. You're near and yet so far. Dennis, you've heard what Charles Ortel was talking about in terms of corporate governance. Is this really going to affect stock prices in the future? Well, clearly, confidence is what moves stock prices. And if we lose confidence in the leadership of the corporate sector, then, of course, it will have a negative impact on stock prices. Do you think that we are going to lose confidence? Well, I think yes. I think we have. I think uh, repeatedly, as we have lost confidence with our co congressional leaders, we're losing confidence with our corporate leaders, especially with the, the advent and the publicity here on insider trading. It's becoming, <clears throat> it's becoming a serious issue, and concerns are permeating down to the, the the, the, the investor and the investor is really disappointed. Charles Hortel, what do you make of that? Investors lost confidence in the marketplace as well as in corporate executives? I think absolutely. I mean, we, we've gone through a period, if you go back to when we got, both got into business in the early 1980s, um, it was really reflexively the opportunity was to think about which equity to buy. Equities were so cheap versus their, their tangible or their breakup value. And since 1999, they've risen to the point where they're way, way above their downside case. And I think uh, just as you know, bubbles get pushed up to a big level. I think this bubble is going to pop. I think a lot of people are going to lose a lot of money and are going to lose confidence uh, that what they owned or what they thought they owned had real value. And that's going to be very negative. Dennis Hines, this idea of confidence, that doesn't seem to be the same script that the G8 uh, leaders are reading from. They say they're confident that economic growth is going to bail us out. Do you buy it? Well, uh, I certainly buy them saying that. And I think they had no alternative except to say that. Uh, given the tragedy we have in Greece, and the surrounding periphery, uh, they have nothing to say except positive things. Because if they were to jump on the negative bandwagon, it's self-fulfilling. So the, the problem really is, is that our price is reflecting what, uh, in fact, is the negative tone uh, in conversation. And uh, uh, it was pr pretty revealing. I was hoping to be very conclusive with you and uh, the viewing audience and talking about whether the old bromide of selling in May and then go away was to be realized or not. Well, we've only got a couple days left, a couple days of trading next week on Tuesday, for example. So do you sell in May and go away, Dennis? Well, if you were to use today's uh, close, I'm afraid I'm unequivocally inconclusive. What's happened here is that earlier in the week, I had joined uh, a number of other bears, and I had taken uh, profits on half my long position. I was to await, and I had counseled and advised that you wait for the end of the week to determine whether, in fact, the bearishness is more lasting and what we had happened as a result of the G8 positive tone, we've had the market rally substantially today, and it did, in fact, close above that wonderful line in the sand, the 50-day moving average at 1323 on S&P futures. However, there were two hurdles it had to overcome. One was a 50-day moving average. The second was a downtrend channel, for those who understand what that means, but it was stopped right at the top of that, which, in fact, bodes poorly going into next week. So you're unequivocally equivocal at the moment. I'm afraid I am unequivocally equivocal. All right, Charles Ortel, this idea that we're hearing from G8 leaders that economic growth is going to bail out most of the developed world, are they just trying to buy time? I think so. I think they're trying to kick the can down the road. I mean, the way I look at it, we are going to be in a gauntlet starting in June, a dangerous gauntlet that's going to run till September of 2012. And I picked those, those endpoints because it's only in September 2012 where we we'll begin to get a sense for which way the U.S. election is going to go, which way the direction of the U.S. economy is going to go. In the interim, we have numerous landmines that are buried beneath the surface that could, could be touched by all sorts of uh, different actors. We have domestic landmines. We have foreign landmines. 
landmines. We have landmines in the Middle East, in Europe, and elsewhere. And unfortunately, so many of our corporations are highly leveraged, um, and they now face increasingly more. Well, they issued a lot of debt because debt levels are pretty low. You can buy, you can issue debt and it doesn't cost you very much. Exactly. That sounds a little bit like 2005 and subprime lending to me. I mean, eventually debts have to be refinanced and repaid. Dennis Hines, uh, I was speaking yesterday with uh, Frank Martin of Martin Capital. He says he's got 70 percent of his portfolios are in cash. Would you be going to cash? You said you took some profits. I would uh, this this coming week that if we're unable to uh, if we're unable to follow through with some of this bullishness today and yesterday, then yes, I would agree and I would reduce myself back to 100% to cash, awaiting for uh, what would be a 5% correction and perhaps not long not larger, but only to then reinvest. But after, in fact, we've run out of uh, sellers. Charles Ortel, go to cash right now if you're not already in cash. Uh, I would suggest a cash and. Certain currencies, the Norwegian krona uh, stands out, maybe the Canadian dollar, not your traditional currencies, not euro, not, not dollar. The, not the U.S. dollar, not, not the, the euro? Not, not, no, not at all. And, what about gold? Uh, I like gold and would, would add to my holdings uh, below 1,500. Um, I've been pro gold for some time. Um, I actually think the most interesting place to be is on the short side, uh, looking at volatility, uh, looking at options on interest rate uh, futures, euro dollar interest rate futures. Um, but that's for the adventurous and that's for people who can. That's for the sophisticated investor. Exactly. Dennis Hines, what about that idea of art? Right, if you go to 100 percent cash, you say wait for a 5 percent correction. What kind of time frame are we talking about? One oh, quarter or longer? Well, what's happened? We've had these happen. This is throughout the entire summer. We've had, uh, over the past four years, we've had three of those four years, we've had uh, average 5% corrections. So I think that's what we're looking for. We've only gotten more extreme corrections in the early 2000, where we've had 10 to 12%. So I would look for a correction back to 5%. That would only happen now if, in fact, we've had further positive developments in Europe, and, in fact, we've, we've had a concurrence and agreement as to how to tackle this deficit All right, problem. We're going to leave it there. Dennis Hines, RW Pressbridge, Charles Hotel, Newport Value Partners. Coming up, a look at.